The first two examples are going to talk about copyright from the perspective of the copyright users, from people who want to use copyrighted materials but are not able to do that. So one classical example is this film called Tire Nation. It's a film made by that guy. And this film costed $218 to be made. And it went to Cannes. It went to the Cannes Festival. The headlines here, they say, micro-budget film wows the Cannes Festival. So basically, uh, this guy spent $200, made a film, went to Cannes. The problem was that, like any other film, this film used music. And in order to clear the rights for the music appearing in the film, he received a bill of $400,000. So the film costed $218 to be produced, and the rights for clearing the rights of the music inside the film, they would have he would have to spend $400,000. So the conclusion here is it's very easy right now to make a film for $200. Everyone can do it. But please do it in a white room in silence and with your friends and make sure they are really your friends because if they are not you might get into legal trouble so that's the first point the second point is about an experiment that was made by this guy called Jay Lazica who wrote this book uh, and he decided to write to all the movie studios in the United States asking for permission to use small clips of the films only for domestic purposes. So he was committed that he would show the films only to his family. There was no, absolutely no popular or public screening at all. So I wanted to use small excerpts of your films only for my family. He received no from the majority of the students with the exception of Universal. Universal said, you want to show them only to your family? Okay, $900 for every 15 seconds. But my favorite answer actually came from Disney. And Disney sent him a letter, which is this letter here. And the letter reads the following. He wanted to use Mary Poppins. So they said, due to the growing number of requests that we are receiving from individuals, school groups, churches, corporations, and other organizations that wish to use clips from our production as part of their video projects and other similar uses, we have had to establish a general policy of non-cooperation with requests of the na this nature. And then they finish by saying, please understand that our denial of uh, your request is not arbitrary, and that we have consistently denied many similar requests. So basically what Disney is saying is that they say no to anyone. So basically, can I use? No. Public use? No. Public interest use? No. No. And it's very funny because basically what Disney is doing is preventing someone to do with them the same thing that they did with public domain works like the Brothers Grimm and everybody else. So the entire Disney empire was built appropriating other people's works. And now we cannot appropriate Disney's works on our turn. So that leads me to the two final other examples. And now these examples they have to do with the copyright owners or connected copyright uh, owners wanting to use material that have to do with them or was produced by them and being unable to do that. So my f the first example in this second part is, this is a German photographer. Uh, his name is Jesko von Putkamer. He is very famous in Brazil for photographing indigenous populations like the Ikpeng. So basically, Jesko Putkamer photographed the Ikpeng in a very important moment, which was the moment in which they were getting in touch with the white man. So they had never had any contact until the 50s. 
and Yesko Putkamer was there on this cataclysmic moment in which an entire worldview were collapsing and they were getting in touch with the white man. And so he photographed this moment. All the pictures uh, were assigned and are managed by the Yesko Putkamer Cultural Center, this place here. And it's very funny because the Ikpeng very recently realized that they could do documentaries about themselves. So basically, they went to the center and they wanted to use the pictures that were taken from them at that particular moment. Guess what the answer was? No, you cannot use these pictures because they are copyrighted and you have to pay the same price that anyone that wants to use these pictures for audiovisual purposes have to pay. And it's a considerable amount of money that prevented Dick Peng from using the pictures. But the funny thing is that if you go to YouTube, there is a lot of materials about the Ik Peng freely available online. There is even a Brazilian band that is based in the capital of the country, Brasilia, uh, which is called Ik Peng, and it's a trance psychedelic band. So it's a psychedelic trance band that used the name Ik Peng. It's funny because we told Dick Peng about this particular band, and I can tell you that they were not really happy. And I can tell you also that it's not good to have indigenous groups not happy with you, because their conflict resolution ways are very different from ours. So basically, it's a very interesting thing. So Dick Peng themselves were prevented to use their work, even though a lot of other people were using it. So number four has to do with the Brazilian soap operas. As you know, most of them are produced by global television. Sometimes you even get to see them in Portugal or Spain, I guess. So this is a very important soap opera called Vale Tudo. It's important for an entire generation in Brazil. But if you go to the media center of the company that produced the soap opera itself, which is global, you will not find any single chapter of this soap opera online. And the reason for that, one of the reasons, is that copyright is so difficult to get licensing, for instance, from the neighboring rights, uh, that it's impossible even for the company that produced it to make them available. Otherwise, they will be sued, for instance, by actors or for other people that have third part interests in the material. So even the copyright producer cannot make them available. But if you go to YouTube and you type the name of the soap opera that is called Vale Tudo, you will find entire chapters and you can watch basically the whole thing. So I would call this the copyright paradox. Because in this way, we can see that copyright is being dysfunctional, both for the users of copyrighted materials and for the producers of copyrighted materials. So uh, this resembles very much this economic concept that took place in the 60s called the tra tragedy of the commons. Uh, a professor in the United States called Garrett Harding wrote that any sort of goods that are kept under a commons regime, a regime in which everyone can make free usage of that good, for instance, a pasture, a place where you put your calves, where you put your ox to eat, 